Joe Biden represented you, America, today in Normandy, France, on the 80th anniversary of one of the most historic, greatest achievements in American history. And, well, his representation of you was about as embarrassing as you imagine. We'll show you all the lowlights. It's embarrassing. Uh, plus, Donald Trump has narrowed down a short list, kind of short list, of potential running mates. We'll break it down and tell you all the people who made the cut. And Byron Donalds, one of those names on the list, is pushing back against big time lies against him. And he's doing it very, very well. I want you to see that, too. There's a lot to get to. So let's get right to it. We're brought to you by the Electronic Payments Coalition. My name's Larry O'Connor. Call me Larry. Little subdued, actually, because this is an amazing day to commemorate what the greatest generation did 80 years ago as they stormed the beaches of Normandy. An unbelievable achievement of courage and sacrifice. And uh, honestly, what America has always stood for, right? Freedom, liberty, pushing back against fascism and oppression for people we don't even know. And to see the people of France the people of Europe thanking those veterans who are still there today. It, it was stirring. It was emotional. It was fantastic. Until the president of the United States showed up. Let's take a look at what everyone's looking at. You know, he gave a speech there, but honestly, I, hardly anyone's talking about what he said. We'll, we'll show you a little bit of what he said, but it's really more about how he behaved and what he did and how weird it was, how weird he is, how out of it he is. Take a look at this moment right here. Everyone's talking about this moment. He greets the president of France, President Macron, and then uh, he goes to, well, you what? Distinguished guests, please welcome the Honorable Lloyd J. Austin. All right, now, Clearly, it looks like he's trying to sit down. And there is a chair there, but the chair is a little bit further back, I think. And and clearly, he's not supposed to be sitting down. Jill's doing nothing to help him, by the way. Right? Here's Jill. Jill's supposed to be his minder, right? His handler, his, his hospice care worker. And she's doing nothing. She's just standing there letting him do whatever it is he's doing. By the way, look at the veterans there who were like, what, 20 years older than him, watching, saying, what the hell is wrong with this guy? Right? Look at all the vets in the back there. These incredible, courageous army rangers that climbed those cliffs at Point du Pont. And he he's like, he can't even stand properly. So a lot of people are saying, well, he thought he was supposed to sit down and he's not supposed to sit down. But then there's something else that this could be. And take a look again and watch when he just does a little squat here and then uh, oh, oh, oh. You see what I'm saying? You see what I'm getting at? I mean, he's done it before. He did it in front of the Pope. He did it in front of the White House last month. And then it's like, oh, oh, oh. You can see Jill instinctively brings the hand up to the nose because she knows what's about to happen next. I mean, I, I don't know what's going on there. We'll never know exactly what's going on there. I know what it looks like. Our great producer, Kevin McMahon, who you should be following on X, by the way. That's his account right there. He uh, he gives us a vivid yet subtle description of what it appears is happening with the President of the United States, the leader of the free world, the commander-in-chief of our armed forces, as he goes to represent all of us on this solemn and important historic day, the 80th anniversary of the Normandy invasion. I know what it looks like. That's exactly what it looks like. He's pinching a loaf. He's taking a growler. Or, as the Babylon Bee puts it, he's, tr <laughs> he's dropping the first bomb on Normandy in 80 years. God, they're good. <laughs> yeah, that would be apparently, allegedly, supposedly, reportedly not confirmed. But once again, that's your president pooping his pants. This time, I mean, he's sort of directing it at the president of France, which generally I would support. 
and applaud, except maybe not on this day, maybe not the 80th anniversary of D-Day. Let's move a little further on in the uh, in the uh, uh, program here. Here is uh, President Biden sitting alongside all of these other world leaders. Au-dessus de nos têtes, des énormes obus de nos navires de guerre. Certains de ces you can see there, there's uh, Prime Minister Trudeau there representing Canada. You got the President of France. You got uh, yeah, Prince William there representing Great Britain, wearing his military medals. And um, and you see Joe Biden there. Um, Joe Biden, some would say he was closing his eyes because he was overcome by the emotion of the moment. Some less charitable folks would say the old man just fell asleep like he always does. He just decided to close his eyes and take a bit of a nap. I would like to think that he is um, closing his eyes and sort of experiencing every nuanced moment of the load he just dropped in his pants, seeping into the very crevices of his upper thighs. To me, that's what he's doing. That's how I would like to think of my president. Why do I think that? Well, because after the presentation and the speeches were made, And it came time for the individual world leaders to greet and congratulate these 100-year-old-plus veterans of the D-Day invasion who have made the trip around the world to be there once again to commemorate this incredible human American achievement. As all the world leaders went there to greet them, our president got quickly ushered away. Yeah, so there's President Macron spryly running up and down the stage, greeting all of the vets, hugging them, thanking them. There goes our guy walking. You can tell he's sort of like trying to keep everything together there in the uh, posterior region. Have you noticed that he walks that way? He walks in a way where he tries not to move his hips. You try doing this. Try walking in such a way where all of the motion of your legs are from like the top of your knees down but you you keep everything tight at the hip area and waist area. See, you're doing that because you don't want anything to jostle. See it? See it? Look at him. Look at him. Look at him. Jill's guiding him out of there. His upper torso doesn't move at all, right? And it's because he's got a load. Why else is he the first one to leave? Why else is he getting the hell out of there? Why is Jill dragging him out of there saying, all right, Joe, we got we to gotta clean you up? This is embarrassing for everybody, right? And the way he walks. And meanwhile, again, other world leaders are all taking the moment, soaking it in, properly representing their country, properly giving uh, due deference and praise and love to these incredible heroes. There's Macron getting it done on behalf of France. Now, uh, that could be what happened with Joe Biden. It seems to be the indications point to, and the Babylon Bee is confirmed through their own independent reporting, that that's what happened. Uh, meanwhile, uh, there is this video of him saying to Pre- well, go ahead and take a listen. <laughs> All right, I don't know if you caught it. I'll uh, listen one more time. Now, yeah, it, this is the president of France greeting the president of the United States at the red carpet right there in the village. By the way, if you've never been to the Normandy, it, it's amazing. If you've never been to Normandy and been to the, the cemetery there and the monument, at some point in your life, put it on your bucket list. You've got to go there. I just happened to be able to go last year. It's phenomenal. I recognize where he's walking here. It's, it's amazing. Um, he's walking down the red carpet with the president of France on his way to this commemoration. And he's telling the president of France 
my advanced people tell me I've got to be the first one to leave so as not to hold anybody up. Well, first of all, who's running things here? You're the president of the United States. You're representing America on a day of our monumental achievement and the loss of hundreds of thousands of American troops on those beaches. You take your own damn good time. You don't get bossed around by the advanced team. Um, what you don't hear is President Macron's response. Here, let me try to, I, I read lips for a living. Let me just, and I also speak French. So here he is. He's explaining how he has to leave early, advance team. Oh, we, oui, we, oui, I understand, Monsieur President. Uh, thank you for being here. Why do you smell like a porter, John? Wow. Well, we, oui, we, oui. or may I say in this case, poo poo. Because there is a smell coming, and it seems to be right from your. Uh, derriere? How you say? You crap your pants again? I understand. My great-grandfather is an old man, too. He's very feeble. And uh, this is the worst French accent in the history of mankind. That's our president, guys. You want to know how bad it is? Take a look at this. Take a look at him arriving there in the presidential suburban. And look at how disoriented he is. Could he just fake it at least? Could somebody inside the car say, okay, sir, you're about to step out. The world's eyes are going to be on you. Can you at least pretend like you know where you are, what you're doing, and where you're going? Because, you know, you've got the nuclear codes. Look at the Secret Service guys, by the way. Look at look at how they know. Look, look at him. This, this is what we've got now. This is who's representing us. And this is, at, at the moment where we're acknowledging the courage and bravery, achievement, strategy, military power, and sacrifice of our men and women, men at the time in uniform, when we're, we're acknowledging the incredible leadership and power of Dwight Eisenhower, who would soon become president of the United States, who coordinated this incredible achievement on those very shores, this is what we've got. This is what we're now bringing to the table. Also, did you notice when you look at the 100-year-old veterans of World War II and you look at the 81-year-old president of the United States, so he was born a year before D-Day. Right. So he's 20 years younger, maybe 18 years younger than the World War II vets. Do you notice there's not a big difference between the two? Have you noticed that they're all sort of that 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 20 years disappears in an instant? Because yeah, he's 81, but I'm gonna tell you something. He's a really old 81. Yesterday, before the Normandy events, he sat with uh, ABC News and gave an interview. And in the interview, he was asked about the current state of affairs of uh, Europe and where Europe is now 80 years after America helped liberate it from fascism. And he said this about Vladimir Putin. Let me ask you about what Vladimir Putin said last night about this authorization of American weapons inside Russia. Uh, he said the supply of high precision weapons to Ukraine for strikes on Russian territory is direct participation in this war. Uh, he went on to say that this is the way to serious problems and again talked about Russia's nuclear capabilities. Does that concern you? I've known him for over 40 years. He's concerned me for 40 years. He's not a decent man. He's a dictator and he's struggling to make sure he holds his country together while still keeping this assault going. We're not talking about giving them weapons to strike Moscow, to strike the Kremlin, to strike him just across the border where they're receiving significant fire from conventional weapons used by the Russians to go into Ukraine to kill Ukrainians. My God, he's getting worse and worse by the day. 
we talked about this yesterday, the loss of breath control, the loss of the use of his vocal cords, um, and how uh, just just out of it he seems at all times. Um, but beyond that, beyond the performance, beyond the the details of what he just shared, uh, beyond the uh, lack of cognitive ability and physical ability to actually even conduct an interview, do you realize how high uh, the volume they had to crank up on his microphone was? Because he doesn't have his little karaoke mic. You know, this mic that he likes to use. Um, listen to his voice and how feeble he is. He's not a decent man. He's a dictator. And he's struggling to make sure he holds this country together. Yeah, okay. But uh, right before that, he said this. I've known him for over 40 years. He's concerned me for 40 years. I've known him for over 40 years, says Joe Biden, the president of the United States. Well, I mean, listen, it's the fact is Joe Biden has held public office for over 50 years. So I guess it's possible that he's known Vladimir Putin for over 40 years. But see, here's the problem with that. Uh, 40 years ago, Vladimir Putin, now the president for life, dictator of Russia. At the time, he was Vladimir Putin undercover KGB operative for the Soviet Union. So if in fact Joe Biden knew Vladimir Putin for over 40 years, it means he knew him when he was a KGB spy. Okay. So uh, one of three things is happening here. Either Joe Biden interacted with a KGB spy when he was a senator in the early 80s. Uh, B, Joe Biden is a bald-faced liar, and he's saying just crazy sh** to try to impress people. Or three, his brain just doesn't function, and he has no idea what the hell or who the hell he's talking about. As usual... We like to keep open the possibility that it's a combination of all three. But I find it very hard to believe that Joe Biden has known Vladimir Putin for over 40 years. So what did Biden say in Normandy? What was his speech? It was barely coherent. But he did say one thing that has gotten a lot of people's attention, where he drew a comparison between the fight to liberate Europe from the Nazi oppression of World War II to today's threat against Ukraine from Putin and Russia. He said this. They've been inflicted on the Russian aggressors. They've suffered tremendous losses in Russia. The numbers are staggering. 350,000 Russian troops dead or wounded. Now, we've tried to get the transcript of the speech from the White House, because usually by now they will have printed the speech and they've cleaned up all of the mistakes that he makes. Because we want to know what in the hell he's talking about here. Now, uh, he might be confusing Russia with Ukraine. Okay, that's one possibility. Listen. They've been inflicted on the Russian aggressor. They've suffered tremendous losses in Russia. The numbers are staggering. 350,000 Russian troops dead or wounded. Okay, that could be it. Uh, or he could be lamenting the loss of life for the Russians, which I guess he could be doing. Like, isn't it terrible that Putin has put Russia in such harm's way that they've suffered all these losses? But that that doesn't seem quite in keeping with his character and past remarks that he's made. He hasn't express regret. And why would you express regret about the loss of Russian troops versus the loss of Ukrainian, well, troops and civilians, let's not forget. Uh, we're not sure. We don't know. And see, that's part of the problem. Because you've got a president of the United States representing our country on this incredible, momentous occasion. And we have no idea what the hell he's talking about. Oh, and one other thing. He decides to take this occasion to draw parallels to the world we're living in right now compared to what it was like under Nazi aggression in the 40s on the day that American troops undertook this incredible adventure to begin the liberation of Europe from Nazi fascists. And he decides that the perfect analogy then would be Russia and Ukraine, which is kind of weird, right? Um, because there's another war going on in the world right now 
that is a much better example, right? I mean, you want to compare the Nazis to someone. Sure, I guess you can compare them to Russia, but wouldn't it be a better comparison to compare the Nazis to Hamas? You know, and, and the anti-Semitic murder of innocent Jews in Europe during World War II versus the anti-Semitic murder of Jews, innocent Jews today in Israel? He made zero mention of that. It was a great opportunity to connect the dots of the fight for freedom and against anti-Semitism of World War II and the evil, hateful Jew hatred that motivated so much of World War II. It would have been a great opportunity to do that. But for some reason, Joe Biden made no mention of that. Zero. Not one mention. Which is odd, don't you think? Unless, of course, he's, you know, taking sides in that conflict. I don't know about you, but I need sort of a cleanse. It is so embarrassing and mortifying that we, our country, is represented by this guy on this day in this way, that just for a couple of minutes, if we could, could we remember 40 years ago when in this same spot, on this same day, instead of Joe Biden, we had a real president speaking on our behalf? Here in Normandy, the rescue began. Here, the Allies stood and fought against tyranny in a giant undertaking unparalleled in human history. We stand on a lonely, windswept point on the northern shore of France. The air is soft, but 40 years ago at this moment, the air was dense with smoke and the cries of men, and the air was filled with the crack of rifle fire and the roar of cannon. At dawn on the morning of the 6th of June, 1944, 225 rangers jumped off the British landing craft and ran to the bottom of these cliffs. Their mission was one of the most difficult and daring of the invasion, to climb these sheer and desolate cliffs and take out the enemy guns. The Allies had been told that some of the mightiest of these guns were here, and they would be trained on the beaches to stop the Allied advance. The Rangers looked up and saw the enemy soldiers, the edge of the cliffs, shooting down at them with machine guns and throwing grenades, and the American Rangers began to climb. They shot rope ladders over the face of these cliffs and began to pull themselves up. When one ranger fell, another would take his place. When one rope was cut, a ranger would grab another and begin his climb again. They climbed, shot back, and held their footing. Soon, one by one, the rangers pulled themselves over the top, and in seizing the firm land at the top of these cliffs, they began to seize back the continent of Europe. 225 came here. After two days of fighting, only 90 could still bear arms. And behind me is a memorial that symbolizes the ranger daggers that were thrust into the top of these cliffs. And before me are the men who put them there. These are the boys of Puente Hope. These are the men who took the cliffs. These are the champions who helped free a continent. And these are the heroes who helped end a war. We had no idea how good we had it. We took it for granted when that man was our president representing us. God, do we deserve better. Uh, for those of you who might not be old enough to have remembered Ronald Reagan as your president, go back and watch that whole speech. And by the way, one other note. At the time, 40 years ago, 1984, the Democrats, the liberals, the left-wingers, the Marxists, they're not too different than they are today. They were there at the time. And they were trying to convince us that that guy, he was too old to be president. That's what they said. He was old. He was feeble. He didn't have it all together. That's what they said about that guy that you just saw. Of course, five months later, he won 49 out of 50 states because it was an election year. Let's just hold on. November's coming. Maybe, just maybe, we'll get it right. And let me ask you something. Can your savings weather an economic storm? Think about what you put away for the future. 
Think about it. Is it cash? Well, inflation can render cash worthless. If you invested in real estate, well, that's good, but real estate can crash. It just did in 2008. Economies built on a mountain of debt can fall like a house of cards. There are very few physical assets that you can own and invest in that can stand the test of time. Gold, gold has withstood as a valued form of money for millennia, literally millennia. It's why people are flocking to it now and why Birch Gold is busier than ever. Through a little known tax loophole, Birch Gold lets you convert a retirement account into a tax sheltered IRA in physical gold. And the best part is it doesn't cost you a penny out of pocket. To learn more about this, text Larry to 989898 and claim your free info kit on gold. Let me ask you again, can your IRA or your 401k weather an economic storm? If not, you gotta call the people I trust, Birch Gold. Text Larry to 989898 and secure your savings today. Late yesterday, it was announced, it was revealed, it was well, maybe leaked, that the Trump campaign has asked for official paperwork filings and vetting from a handful of Republicans to be the running mate for Donald Trump on the Republican ticket. Uh, here is how Jesse Waters revealed the information last night. <laughs> Fox News alert, breaking details on Donald Trump's search for vice president. Reports out tonight that say the Trump campaign has begun the process of formally requesting information from a small group of potential running mates. The vetting process has begun. The potential candidates are North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum, Florida Senator Marco Rubio, and Ohio Senator J.D. Vance. Other people are still likely being considered, but this initial outreach suggests that these men are on the top of Trump's list. Other potential running mates like Tim Scott have been vetted, but not to the level of Burgum, Rubio, and Vance. Donald Trump says he plans to make his VP pick announcement closer to the Republican National Convention in July. Chief political anchor and executive editor of the special report, Brett Baer, joins me now. So, Brett, this Burgum movement is real. Uh, apparently, the Trump people were really impressed by how he went to the courthouse to defend the president. What are you hearing? Yeah, Jesse, good evening. I, the Burgum movement is real. Uh, paperwork is being exchanged. Uh, and you're right to point to those top three. They definitely uh, are under consideration uh, for VP. But sources are telling us that that list is a little longer than that. Uh, we're in a different phase now. They're in the serious vetting. Uh, but it also includes uh, Arkansas Senator Tom Cotton. It includes, as you mentioned, South Carolina Senator Tim Scott, Nor New York Congresswoman Elise Stefanik, uh, Florida Congress. Congressman Byron Donalds, and even former presidential candidate and uh, former HUD secretary, Dr. Ben Carson. Uh, so the list is a little bit longer than just the three, but they are narrowing down. And to your point, I don't think this is going to finish up until right before, even at the convention, according to sources we talked to. Hey, hey, all right, so uh, let's break this down and talk about the names. And uh, we don't have um, we don't have Arkansas Senator Tom Cotton on those list because other than Brett Baer's mention right there, um, we hadn't actually heard that as part of this first release. Also, by the way, I've been told subsequently that Secretary of State Mike Pompeo is still under consideration as well. But both Cotton and Pompeo seem to be longer shots than these seven, let alone the three that Jesse Waters just isolated. So. Uh, what to make of this and and the timing, what's going to happen with the timing here? Uh, you just heard Brett say that it's going to be closer to the convention, if not at the convention. There are some analysts who believe that it would be wise for Trump to actually announce it sooner rather than later. It means that he's got somebody else campaigning with him around the country, uh, especially while he has to deal with the continued fallout over the conviction in Manhattan. It's a good way to change the subject. Right. But there are other analysts who say, no, 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 that would be a bad idea because it just gives the left and Democrats and the media another target to go after after. And you want to keep that until later. And honestly, the way the polls are showing right now that Donald Trump has felt no negative repercussions from the conviction in New York. In fact, there's a couple of polls that show that he got a bounce, a bounce out of being convicted, that he doesn't need to change the subject. He should continue to ride what he's got right now. Either way, the convention is scheduled for the week of July 11th. That's the second week of July. And so that means he's got five weeks 
before the convention. He's got to do it by the convention, though. That's when the actual official nomination process will occur. Last year, or excuse me, eight years ago with Mike Pence, uh, he made that decision uh, the week of the convention. That's when that announcement was made. I believe it was the weekend right before the convention. All right. So here's who we've got. Uh, let's start with Burgum, who seems to be sort of the least known of all of these guys. I mean, could anybody tell me who the governor of North Dakota was before the presidential primaries when he decided to run for president? Uh, it became kind of a punchline. It's like, oh, okay, the Doug Burgum, the governor of North Dakota, is going to run. Who's he? Um, but he actually impressed quite a few people during the debates, uh, especially considering he didn't have a whole lot of name recognition. Uh, what you learn about him or what you know about him, number one, is that he did run as a huge supporter of Donald Trump and a very loyal supporter of Donald Trump. He also uh, is an expert when it comes to uh, to energy. Uh, he's a self-made man, uh, a rich man, and he made most of his money in the oil and gas field. Uh, if we are to immediately reverse courts and get back to energy independence, you want a guy like Doug Burgum uh, sort of helping to cut through the red tape. He's also well-liked. It's hard to find people who have anything bad to say about him, at least Republicans and conservatives. And that's not always the case within our party. Uh, so that apparently Trump admires him because Trump is impressed with people who are good businessmen who make money because that's what he is. Uh, so that's Burgum. Rubio, we know, and the fact that he's on the short list, I think, is a testament to the fact that he's been out front recently, really, really pushing hard on behalf of Donald Trump and against the media. That's something that gets Trump's attention and something that Trump needs and wants in a running mate and in a vice president. Uh, by the way, I don't see many of these candidates really bringing anything to the table in terms of of electoral advantage, bringing their state to the table or bringing other states to the table, except for one. And that's J.D. Vance. You think about it for a minute. No, Ohio's already baked in the cake. Ohio's going red. It's not a toss-up state anymore like it was. But you get J.D. Vance on board and you send him, You the entire campaign, he spends all of his time in Wisconsin, Michigan, and in Western Pennsylvania. That could be electoral magic. J.D. Vance gets it. J.D. Vance, out of all these people, J.D. Vance is probably the one with America first kind of policies in his veins, in his DNA. Uh, his experience researching and writing Hillbilly Elegy and the fact that that book spoke to so many of those voters in that area, in the Rust Belt, who had voted for Barack Obama and flipped a vote for Donald Trump, well, those guys weren't there in Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin in 2020. Trump's got to get them back. And maybe J.D. Vance is the one to bring them back. Also, one advantage J.D. Vance has is even though he's a senator, he's a new senator. He's only been in Washington, D.C. for less than a year. So he's not tainted by the swamp. And that's a good thing. Uh, ben Carson is a great guy, and everybody likes him. And he ran for president, and he was in the cabinet for Donald Trump. In fact, one of the few people who stayed the entire four years as a secretary of housing and urban development. He's got a great life story. I don't see it. I just don't think it's happening. And I don't know if he's got the fight in him. And you need somebody with fight. I'll tell you who does have fight, Elise Stefanik. Elise Stefanik from New York has been a champion on behalf of finding out and rooting out the corruption in the intelligence communities and the FBI. She was the first one to call out James Comey during the whole Russian collusion fiasco because James Comey had not briefed uh, the leadership in Congress about the surveillance of Donald Trump. That's a violation of law. And I remember it was Elise Stefanik, who I believe was a freshman congresswoman at the time in 2017, calling Comey out on that at the House Intel Committee. She's recently been a champion on behalf of uh, education reform. As you know, she's the one who brought in the presidents of Harvard and, and MIT and Pennsylvania, uh, UPenn. Uh, she's the one who's been calling them out on the goings on against uh, Jewish students on campus. Uh, she's been great. Problem, and, and oh, and get this, I'm told that you gotta get a woman on the ticket because that'll appeal to suburban housewives. Here's the cool thing about Elise Stefanik. She looks like a suburban housewife. She is a suburban housewife. Uh, and she's not one of those sort of va-va-boom, glammed-up women that often get uh, picked as Republican 
uh, uh, well, Christy Nome's one of the types, right? I mean, we're, it, it, you see Christy Nome on television, it's like, wow, she looks fabulous. She looks like she could be a TV star. I don't know if that's the type that appeals to suburban housewives. Lee Stefanik, I mean, she's just a regular gal. I like that about her. She's whip smart, too. Um, here's the problem with Lee Stefanik. She's a New York Republican. New York Republicans are not necessarily the most conservative Republicans. In fact, if you go to CPAC and look at her conservative rating, she's like 55, 56, 57 percent in terms of her votes. A lot of her votes are not as conservative as you might want them to be. And as a conservative, I want someone who's going to be a more solid person there being a heartbeat away from the presidency. But she's great. I love her. Don't get me wrong. Uh, Tim Scott. Everybody likes Tim Scott. Uh, he's incredibly appealing. I got to tell you, I flew down to South Carolina like two months ago uh, to Charleston, and he was sitting like two rows ahead of me and walking through the airport. You, it's amazing. All the people in Charleston, everybody yells at him. Everyone waves at him. Everyone loves this guy. Um, I've been on a plane with him twice, actually. Back in 2016, he was actually campaigning for Marco Rubio, and we were heading up to New Hampshire together from Washington, D.C., and I had a great time talking with him. He's just a really kind affable, smart man who is a good politician. And by the way, of all of these candidates, he's the one who speaks best to the evangelical vote. The, the Christian conservatives in the Republican Party, he speaks their language. He's good at that. Uh, he's a good campaigner. We'll see. I'm glad he's on the list. I don't know if he's got enough to pull it across the finish line. And then Byron Donalds, quite possibly, other than Doug Burgum, might be the other person who is uh, least well-known in this case. But boy, is he a strong advocate for Donald Trump and a real ferocious fighter. In fact, a little later in the program, we're going to show you how good he is at fighting on behalf of Trump, on behalf of conservative Republicans, and frankly, on behalf of himself. Uh, he's great. And whether he ends up the running mate or not, he's got a bright future in the Republican Party. He's someone everyone is watching. Uh, also noted about Donalds and Rubio, they both come from the state of Florida. There could be some technical problems there with the running mate coming from the same state as the candidate for president. That's easily resolved, though. Uh, Donald Trump just needs to change his residency to any one of the houses he owns in other states, and you're set. Everything's fine. Uh, that's where things stand right now in the running mate sweepstakes. Uh, and it's cool that Republicans are now focusing on this kind of thing. They're focusing on the mechanics and the process of getting the tickets solidified and moving forward to the convention so we can have this election. Because from Trump's perspective and from Republicans' perspectives, uh, this campaign is about the policies that need to be restored to the White House to bring this country back from the brink that it's on right now, whether it's our economy, our border, whether it's uh, law and order in our streets, it's national security and our standing in the world where we can have a president who doesn't look like he's you know, going number two in his adult diaper at an event, you know, we, we need to get back to where we had a firm standing on this planet as the leader of the free world. We don't have that right now. These are all the things that we Republicans and conservatives are looking at with regard to this election. What are Democrats looking at? What have they got? What are they selling to the voters? Well, you know what? Earlier today, Hillary Clinton put out a, a post on X, which sort of sums up the entirety of of their conversation with voters. This is, this is her post commemorating the D-Day invasion today. 80 years ago today, thousands of brave Americans fought to protect democracy on the shores of Normandy. This November, all we have to do is vote. I also like the touch there where she limits who can reply. Only, only people Hillary follows is allowed to reply to that because she's fighting against fascism and don't you dare say anything back to her and disagree. I think our pal Ben Shapiro had a, a fine response. What an enormously stupid and vile comment. Trump is not Hitler and voting is not storming a beach under a hail of machine gun fire to free millions from the tyranny of the Nazis. But honestly, that is all they have, literally. So that's what this election is going to be about. And I'm looking forward to Donald Trump having a partner, a running mate on the campaign trail to help fight this fight for him. Uh, and as far as Hillary Clinton goes, man, let's end this segment on an upbeat note. Hillary Clinton will never, ever, 
ever be president. And by the way, what she tweeted there, that's one of the reasons why. Isn't that great? Millions of Americans earn and use credit card rewards. Corporate megastores want to take those rewards away. Rewards that we use on groceries, school supplies, cash back to save on gas and grow our small businesses. Travel miles we use to make memories. The Durban Marshall credit card bill would eliminate credit card rewards. No more travel miles, no more cash back. When lawmakers help corporate megastores line their pockets, American families pay for it. Tell your senator to oppose the Durban Marshall credit card bill. Visit handsoffmyrewards.com to take action today. That's handsoffmyrewards.com. And make sure you stop the Durban Marshall credit card bill. So I mentioned Byron Donalds, congressman from Florida. Uh, let me introduce a little bit of Byron Donalds to you because he made some news yesterday afternoon uh, where he's fighting back to defend himself. And I want you to point out the fact, I want to point out the fact that he's pushing back against lying Democrats. He's pushing back against the media. He's defending himself and he's getting the truth out there. But at the same time, he's defending you. He's defending conservatives. He's defending Republicans. And he's doing it in a very effective way. Uh, now, this all began with minority leader of the House of Representatives, Hakeem Jeffries, lying about Byron Donalds on the floor of the House of Representatives. Here, take a look. Mr. Speaker, it has come to my attention that a so-called leader has made the factually inaccurate statement that black folks were better off during Jim Crow. That's an outlandish, outrageous, and out-of-pocket observation. We were not better off when a young boy named Emmett Till could be brutally murdered without consequence because of Jim Crow. We were not better off when black women could be sexually assaulted without consequence because of Jim Crow. We were not better off when people could be systematically lynched without consequence because of Jim Crow. We were not better off when children could be denied a high quality education without consequence because of Jim Crow. We were not better off when people could be denied the right to vote without consequence because of Jim Crow. How dare you make such an ignorant observation? You better check yourself before you wreck yourself. Check yourself before you wreck yourself. He was talking about Byron Donalds. And let's go quite to, right to the beginning again so you can hear the uh, the origin lie in this entire one-minute lying diatribe. Speaker, it's come to my attention that a so-called leader has made the factually inaccurate statement that black folks were better off during Jim Crow. Now, he uh, did that whole thing. We were not better off. We were not better off. We were not better off. It was all based on that premise that uh, a, a leader in the House of Representatives said that black people were better off under Jim Crow. So did Byron Donalds say that we were better off under Jim Crow? Well, let's check in with Congressman Byron Donalds. America, Joe Biden's campaign is lying to you once again, and they're gaslighting. Now they're trying to say that I said black people were doing better under Jim Crow. I never said that. They are lying. But why would you be surprised? Because they always lie. This is the same Joe Biden that said, if you don't vote for him, then you ain't black. The man is a liar. Sorry, just call it what it is. What I said was, is that you had more black families under Jim Crow. And it was the Democrat policies uh, under HEW, under the welfare state, that did help to destroy the black family. That's what I said. And I also said, you're seeing a reinvigoration of black families today in America. And that is a good thing. So don't listen to the lies from the Biden administration. I know what I said, and I'll say it straight to camera. They got to run to the Philadelphia Inquirer to move their lies. Joe Biden does not care about black people. He never has. He cares about power, first, second, and third. They can go somewhere with all that. See ya. Okay. Game on. Uh, you got to love Byron Donalds coming right back at it in Hakeem Jeffries' face. He's not having any of it. And later on, he posted exactly what his words were. Now, listen, it should be noted that Hakeem Jeffries clearly knows a lot about Jim Crow. And it's appropriate that a Democrat would be well-versed in Jim Crow, considering Jim Crow was a creation of the Democrats. That's his party, after all. So I guess he knows about it. Uh, but here's Byron Donalds. He's uh, sitting here in a cigar lounge, having a little bourbon, smoking a cigar. And he's talking about the state of affairs for black families right now in America. 
a black man talking to black men about black issues, and here's what he said in reference to Jim Crow. I grew up with my mom. My dad and my mom, things didn't work out. As an adult, I look at my father and I say, bro, I don't know what happened, but you're my father and I love you. Wow. I don't know what happened. I wasn't there. Wow. But I'm going to tell you this. Coming growing up, the one thing I knew I wanted to do, and this is not about my father, this is about what I wanted to do, is I wanted to be a father to yeah. my son. Wow. Yeah. And so one of the things that's actually happening in our culture, which you're now starting to see in our politics, is the, re in, the reinvigoration <laughs> of black families with younger black men and black women. And that is also helping to breed the revival of a black middle class in America. You see, during Jim Crow, during Jim Crow, the black family was together. During Jim Crow, more black people were not just conservative, because black people always have been conservative minded, but more black people voted conservatively. And then, H-E-W, Lyndon Johnson, and then you go down that road, and now we are where we are. What's happened in America the last 10 years, and I say it because it's my contemporaries as well as his contemporaries, you're starting to see more black people be married in homes, raising kids. It's when you home with your wife raising your kids, and then you look at the world, you're saying, now, wait a minute, time out. This does not look right. How can I get something to my kids? It goes back to the conversation of generational wealth. Not just having a job. Generational wealth. I'm looking at my kids. How can my kids be on my shoulders when they take off in life? That's what's happened. Let me tell you something. What you just heard from Byron Donalds is absolute toxic nuclear waste for Democrats. They, the last thing they want is for people to hear what Byron Donalds just said about the importance of fathers in the household and intact families, about fathers being in the home raising their children. This is, this is why they're lying about him. By the way, you heard the reference to Jim Crow. Did you hear Byron Donald say that black people were better off under Jim Crow? Did you hear him say that ever at all? Of course, they're lying about him because that's what they do about conservatives, especially if you're a black conservative or a female conservative or an Asian conservative or a Latino conservative, because you're the worst kind of people ever. They, I mean, look at how they demonize Clarence Thomas, right? They, they, they keep the worst vitriolic insults for people who just dare to roam off from where they're supposed to stay, right? They don't want any, especially minority voters, they don't want black voters to hear Byron Donald say this. Because the most important demographic in voting right now, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, it's not based on your race. It's not based on your religion. It's not based on your, your ethnicity or your immigration status or your nation of origin or any of those things, or your age for that matter. Do you know what the most important demographic is for how you vote Republican or Democrat? It's your marital status, your marital status, especially if you're a woman. If you are a married man, you vote Republican. If you are a married woman, by a smaller margin, you vote Republican. If you are a single man, you tend to vote Republican. But if you are an unmarried woman, especially an unmarried mother, you're voting Democrat. That's why you see so many policies from the Democratic Party pandering to that demographic. And if there is a new revival, a renaissance, an incredibly positive and constructive renaissance of marriages staying intact, and, and especially in minority communities, if men stay home, they get married, they raise their families, like Byron Donalds is advocating here, that's the end of the Democratic Party. It's the end. Of the major, by the way, that's one of the reasons why you see them trying to venture out and create new coalitions, new identity politics. You know, this is why they're trying to build the LGBTQ community to support them. It's why they're trying to go after Muslim voters now and pander to them because they got to find new because they see where it's going big time. So, Byron Donalds, then, now that you've seen exactly what he said, 
He is coming right at him. This is, again, another reason why Donald Trump likes this guy and why he's on the short list for vice president, because he goes right at him. He doesn't back down. He doesn't apologize. He doesn't say, oh, uh, let me just say my words were probably misconstrued. What I meant to say was, no, 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 none of that crap. He comes right at him and goes right to the media like he did here with CNN last night. And watch how he, he doesn't defend himself. In fact, he goes on the offensive. Watch how he does it. One, one thing I really want to just get you to address is there were a lot of people who heard what you had to say, and a lot of them are offended by the idea that you would repeat Jim Crow three times in your comments as if to suggest that that was a time period because that Black families were, in your words, together, because, in your words, Black people were not just more conservative, uh, they voted more conservatively that's a good thing. I mean, it sounds like nostalgia. Do you regret using that time frame as a reference? Nobody ever made nostalgia. That was never the point. It wasn't even about that. So where now I'm going to get my backup is I didn't say that. I didn't even insinuate that. That is where the media and yes, Hakeem you Jeffries you and a lot of other people are taking What, what exactly didn't you no, insinuate? No, 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 no. I'm just so trying just to understand wanna, what you're saying. You. What didn't, what the premise didn't you of insinuate? Your, the premise of your question, I did not insinuate. That is what people are trying to weave into what I said. What I said is crystal clear. It's on my social media. Go to at Byron Donalds on X. You can see the full clip. Abby, I appreciate you playing the full clip. What you are dealing with right now is a political environment where now anything I might say or any major surrogate might say is going to be twisted into the lens of race. That was never the point, not, not well, the idea whatsoever. I, I just want to I mean, so clarify what? my questioning of you. Sure. I mean, I, I understand that um, this idea that you said it was better. You didn't use the words better. But when you talk not. about when you talk about that time period, you're 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 suggesting that because the black family was together, they were better off than they are now. See, this is the problem, Abby. So are, so are, they, so are you saying that, that that's not the Abby. case, that they, the Black family was not better no, off that's, I did when not they say were, that. in your Abby. words, together? Abby, in, let me, let me in put it to you like Jim this. Crow era. Let's agree on something. I am, you know, obviously one of the better communicators in the Republican Party. I know how to put words together. I do it very, very often. So I'm not going to say something that I do not agree with. What America is seeing right now, especially Black America, is the gaslighting that unfortunately does happen in politics, where you take my comments and you want to weave your own political viewpoint well, into what I said. I also, what I, I said is very... I... Let me just jump in here real fast, if I may interrupt, because I want to interrupt to point out how she keeps interrupting him. And by the way, this is... And she knows exactly what she's doing. This is a trick that's, that, that media hosts do, cable news hosts especially, because not only is she jumping in and interrupting him, and not letting him finish what he's saying. He's said three times now he's tried to say what he what, what he's saying. And she completely interrupt him. But also, this is a satellite feed. There's a delay. She's in, uh, where is she, in New York? And he's in Nashville. And there's always like a little second. You can see the delay where he's waiting to cure her. He's trying to be polite. And she continues to interrupt him. Because, again, the last thing they want is for him to actually communicate his ideas and what he's saying. And, and let me just, and he's going to finish. He can speak for himself. But let me just say, the, the whole Jim Crow reference, I got it when he was saying it. The point he was making us, things were awful under Jim Crow where we were in segregation. We didn't have rights. We weren't able to use the same drinking fountain or the bathroom in Democrat-run states. Uh, we weren't able to vote. We were to have all of these things that were awful. And yet somehow, even then, we were able to keep our families intact. Things were worse off for Black people then but we knew the importance of family. What's our excuse right now? That's what he's saying. Not that we're better off, but despite the hardships, our family stuck together was obviously what he was saying. Why, do, why are they trying to twist the words? Why are they injecting their own de definition of what he said or interpretation of what he said? Because they don't want that out there. They don't want people to know that. Because then they lose. I Clear. asked you to you explain on because I wanted to, un what Go I want to undo is understand what you're saying here. Because if you're making a yeah. comparison, you're saying the black family was together then, they're not together now. And, and you're using that to, to try to say that, that things are, are, are bad now. Well, first of all, let me just 
to set the table here, by pretty much every available measure, Black families, Black individuals in this country are better off today than they were during Jim Crow. Would you agree with that? Abby, of course I would. I'm not making that point. And this is the problem. Every What the Democrats, what Hakeem Jeffries did on the House floor, what Jamie Harrison, uh, what, the, what the president of the NAACP, what the Biden campaign, because they're the ones who started this, it was really the Biden campaigns who were trying to cherry pick everything. They're trying to twist my words into saying something. I never said that. What I was talking about was specifically black families. Uh -huh. And the point that black families being together is a great thing for the black community. And you do have to acknowledge the empirical fact that before Lyndon Johnson's policies and the welfare state that was created in the United States, I'm not talking about good, bad, or indifferent. But what about, black families were, hold on, black about, marriage um, rates were significantly higher. Well, what about They're other rising things again that in America. Have, That's a good well, thing. We should celebrate that. that. Do you notice again exactly where she decides to cut him off, right as he's finishing making his point about how when Lyndon Johnson ushered in dependency on the federal government, that's when everything started to fall apart for the black families in America. Every single time he tries to get to that point, she jumps in and interrupts. So why is the Biden campaign going after him? Why are they lying about him? Why are they putting a full court press against Byron Donalds? Well, that just explained. They don't want that message out there because then they lose, you know, this little coalition that they've got. But secondly, because he also uses all of those skills he's got to talk about how much better things were under Donald Trump. And that, well, take a look. Republicans have been the ones who were pushing not just the 64 Civil Rights Act, but the other four civil rights acts that occurred before 1964. Look, That's the history of the, the country. The Democrats, I'm not denying there that. There were Abby, Southern me, Democrats Abby, who can opposed. can I finish my point? All again, I'm asking is to finish on, my point. On the Abby. facts here, there are okay. Southern Democrats who opposed these civil rights bills. But yes, a majority correct. of them voted for it. It was also led by a Democratic president. So you acknowledge that... But you, Southern but, but Democrats, you cannot deny, Southern Democrats but you cannot deny were recruited that, into the Republican Party in the time period after that. So you, when you talk about this, you just have to acknowledge Abby, that there's been a switch happening in the two parties. It's not the same today as it was during Jim Crow. And so when you say that Abby, black people voted conservatively, that actually doesn't really tell us anything. It just tells us uh, that they Abby, voted for the Republican Party, which is a different thing as than it is for today. Are we also going to acknowledge that the, how the, the 64 Civil Rights Act actually got through the U.S. Senate was, in, was because of also the leadership of Senator Everett Dirksen, Dir, uh, Dirksen yeah. who was the minority a Republican absolutely. leader in the United States Senate at that time? Absolutely. You have to acknowledge that. I, I, so I think listen, if we're going to talk about I, this, we have to acknowledge all of the history that went along I wasn't with it. Suggesting and I think that's that a good thing. We should have that historical conversation. I wasn't suggesting that congressional Republicans necessarily were the... the the the, stum the stumbling block for any of this legislation. All I'm saying is that when you ask why do Black people vote for Democrats, you have to acknowledge that that is one of the main reasons. I, I want to just ask one other thing, though, uh, uh, Congressman. It it's striking to me that this conversation about the family, about uh, who is the recipient of government benefits, about who was affected by Lyndon B. Johnson's Great Society. Why is it that that conversation only happens to black people? When white people are on welfare, when white people are recipients of these programs too, when white people have broken families as well, why is this a message that is always directed at black Americans? Uh, I didn't say that at all. I think that's what you're insinuating. But let me let me. I mean, that's what you that did. You were you were trying if, to if recruit you will, black voters. Abby, for if you're President gonna, can, am I allowed to answer the question? Let me let me step into that. OK, a couple of things. Yes. Lyndon Johnson's Great Society, if you look at the empirical data, was destructive in part. And I said even in my comments uh, yesterday in Philadelphia, in part to black families uh, throughout the United States of America. You also had some of the very uh, damaging po uh, policies around the criminal justice system. The 94 crime bill, which was authored by Joe Biden and brought by Joe Biden. Yes, you had the war on drugs that was also very damaging to black communities. All those things have contributed to that. And where we are today in America is trying to have the economic policies and the public policies so that all people can thrive. And if you're actually gonna compare economic policies and public policies 
between the 45th president and the 46th president, it's without question they were better under the 45th. Well, look, I mean, so if you're going to examine today, the hold on, but Abby, if you're going to examine lowest, today in America and again, where I'm we're going you as Americans, the, I'm gonna then you, you have to the have facts, the right set of economic policies and the, the right set of public black policies. I mean, Abby, you've been the Why do you invite somebody onto your show and ask them a question if you don't want to hear their answer? This is what drives people insane about cable news. I mean, she's awful. She's incredibly unimpressive. And I don't know if her job was like, or you go out there and, and you're going to, you know, push back and you're going to, this is going to be your viral moment. Yeah, it's a viral moment, but not to her benefit at all. Byron Donalds is an incredibly patient and uh, got an incredible temperament here. I wouldn't be as calm as he is constantly getting interrupted and again have you noticed exactly when the interruption occurred when he started tying this back to joe biden's economic policies and how disastrous they are right now for black families and black communities she's got a job to do right there and it has nothing to do with getting information and finding out you may disagree with the person you're interviewing i interview people all the time i don't always agree with the answer they give me but the job of an interviewer is to get the answer not to win a debate, but all she wants to do is win a debate here. And Donald's is really handling himself brilliantly, frankly. Watch, watch a little bit more. I mean, the in entire American, interview, I'm just trying to have a conversation. I'm going to interrupt you on the facts, Congressman. The black unemployment sure, rate was the lowest in American history under Joe Biden just last year. The poverty rate for black people is the lowest under Joe Biden. So you cannot say empirically for black people that on a, from a financial level, things were better under Trump. There are other ways that you can make this case, but you cannot say that. All right. This is the moment because that was that was the gotcha, right? You know that everyone in uh, the Biden campaign watching this is like, yes, she used exactly the talking points we gave her. And all of the people who who maybe tuned over from MSNBC because they wanted to see this, you know, they're screaming back at their television. Yes, queen. You did it. You finally did it. You threw it out there and you killed that talking point. So now everybody knows that black people have never had it better than under Joe Biden. I know that because I web it, read it right off of Joe Biden's website. Right. So there. this is the moment. This is the moment where they finally nailed it. Are you ready for it? Are you ready for the answer? So good. Look at Byron. Look at Byron. Look at his face. He's so ready. Look at that face. All right, Byron. Bring it. Oh, uh, actually, let me respond to that because the economic reality is is that even though unemployment might be lower, wages adjusted for inflation, which is the true measure of getting ahead Fair in enough. America, that has been bad under Joe Biden. It was significantly better under Donald Trump because we did not have massive inflation and people were making more money which means you're taking more money home, which means you can begin to prepare for your family, which means you can start to prepare and, and begin thinking about ideas of, of getting assets, accumulating assets and, gen and generating wealth. Joe Biden's economy, Bidenomics, like he likes to call it, I know they don't use the word anymore, that's been destructive of so many families in our country, including black families in our country. That is the empirical economic Look, fact I, I that we have to acknowledge before this election cycle. I Boom. Boom, boom, in every possible way, boom. That's the bottom line. Oh, oh, uh, they're making more money now. Yeah, adjusted for inflation, pal. They're making more money because the government has mandated certain wage increases in certain jurisdictions where uh, things cost more because of all of those mandates. So you're making a little bit, let's say you're making 4% more money now, but if everything costs 10% more, how are you better off? And it's so clearly articulated, it's so clearly and calmly laid out with facts. And even she had to say, okay, well, uh, sure. That right there, what you just saw, that's how you do it. And that's also why Byron Donalds is one of those seven Republicans right now filling out paperwork to be properly vetted to be Donald Trump's running mate. I don't know if he's going to get it, but I can tell you this, Byron Donalds, He's going places. We're going to be talking about Byron Donalds for many, many years to come. That's it for this time. We'll be back next time, but now we're out of time. So we'll see you. My name is Larry O'Connor. You can call me Larry.